So in Alaska, there's this highway that was built in World War II to connect Alaska with the rest of the United States. And to achieve this, the highway actually had to go through Canada, because if you know anything about geography, that kind of has to happen. Uh, and it gave it the name, the Alaska-Canada Highway, or the Alcan Highway for short. Now, as it stands today, the, the road is actually paved, and it's just this long stretch of highway. But back in the 60s, it wasn't paved at all. In fact, it was mostly just a dirt road. So when all of the snow and the ice would melt from the harsh winter, the rain would settle in, and the ground would become very soft and extremely muddy. And then, after it would do that, it would start to freeze over again because they would go through another winter. And long stretches of this road would develop severe ruts that were deep in the ground. And it became such a problem that at each end of the highway, the, the Alaskan government and even the, the Canadian government, they put up signs that said, choose your rut carefully or you'll be in it for the next 200 miles. And it's because they were so deep that you couldn't turn left or right. You had to go on whatever path. And as I was researching this and looking at it, there's even some paths that would go off-road and not even on the highway. They would just lead them off-road before they could get out of the rut. And so you had to choose your cut or your rut carefully or you would be in it for the next 200 miles. And and so I was thinking about that, and I, I saw this illustration in a book that I was reading. I was like, man, that's exactly how Satan's lies operate in our life. Last week, we laid this foundation that we tend to fall into temptations and rebellion against God, and it can almost always be connected to some type of lie that we've listened to and believed from the enemy. The main lie being that there's a better, there's an easier, there's a more comfortable and convenient way to live your purpose in Christ without God. Now, Satan feeds these lies into our mind. He slowly develops these ruts in our mind that we have a hard time getting out of until one day you're stuck in this rut of a lie that Satan's told you and you believe it to be true. And when you're told that it's not true, you have so much difficulty getting out of it. And as a result, you're less likely to serve God to the best of your ability. You'll rely on yourself more than you'll rely on God. And you won't experience this abundant life that we all talk about as Christians, but few of us actually experience. So how do you get out of this rut that Satan has developed in your mind as he's repeated the same lie over and over and over again? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today as we're... Uh, finishing up our series, Take Control, Winning the Battle in Your Mind. As we talked about last week, the first step in getting out of these ruts is to first identify what the lies actually are. So when you, uh, and, and if you missed last week, uh, you're more than welcome to go online and listen to that. But I shared this quote last week from Craig Rochelle, and I'll share it again. It says, you cannot change what you do not confront. And so the first thing is that we have to confront these lies that we've been told which means that you have to be in your Bible more to figure out what those lies are, but you also have to look at some of your patterns and your habits and say, why do I actually do these things? Why is it that I keep falling into the same temptation over and over and over again? What do I actually get out of it? What do I think that I'm getting out of it? And as you start going down kind of a rabbit hole into your lie and into your temptation and into your struggles, then you'll find the lie that Satan has told you. And unless you confront that, you'll never be able to change your patterns and habits. So you need to know that these lies need to be confronted. And you need to do exactly what Jesus did, because he demonstrates this in Matthew chapter 4, 1, verse 1 through 11, just like we talked about last week. He demonstrates this for us, how we can find victory over these things. So I'll read that again. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and, to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor. And he said, all of this I'll give to you if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Now, some of you, you grew up in church and you've probably heard a lot of messages about this uh, piece of scripture because it's actually really easy to preach. Uh, But often what I heard is what Jesus did. So if you look at this story and you, you solely look at what Jesus did, you see that he used scripture as his weapon. And uh, for us Christians in the room that have been going to church for a long time, you understand and you know from all of your experience being in church that other places in the Bible describe the word of God as a double-edged sword. And so that we see it as our weapon, we can use it to, to combat the lies, right? But we, we see that, we see what he did. He, he resisted the devil, he submitted to God, and the devil fleed from him. Like, you can go and connect all these things. But what I actually never really, uh, or what I heard, I'll, I'll continue on that track, so now I'm remembering what I, what I wrote down. Um, but So, like, different practical steps. And, and these are not meant to be overshadowed. It's, it's not that these aren't good disciplines, because they are, and they're essential for your victory in taking control of the battle of your mind. But I always heard, like, this is what Jesus did. Uh, throughout his 30 years of ministry, he memorized the Word of God, which was standard for all Jewish boys. Every Jewish boy, had, by the age of 12, had the first five books memorized. Now, you know, you contrast that to today. I don't know very many 12-year-olds that have the first five books of the Bible memorized. So they lived a completely different lifestyle. But he had all of this memorized. And so I would hear these things like, you know, you got to memorize Scripture because if you can't memorize Scripture, then you can't use Scripture to your advantage to to help you fight these temptations because you don't know it. And and that's true. You do need to do that. You do need to study the Word of God. You do need to pray. But I always heard what Jesus did And even though a thousand percent of that is true, you need to do those things. I started thinking about this weapon that is the sword. Now I can pick up a sword and I can I can probably swing it and I can do some things with it, but unless I learn how to actually wield the sword, if I'm in a sword fight, I'm gonna lose every time. Right? I don't know if you've ever watched like fencing, especially like college fencing. I would get warmed up in there. I can swing a little fence stick thing, but I I don't know any of the techniques. I don't know how to use that effectively. And since I don't know how to use that effectively, if I stand in front of the enemy, the, the opponent, and they have the same weapon, the same type of weapon, because you see Satan's using scripture against them. If they have the same weapon in their arsenal, they're not using it correctly, but I'm going to lose that battle every time. So it's great to know that Jesus picked up the sword and started swinging it. But what I want to try and do today in this message is to help you learn how to use it. Not just what to do, but how to accomplish it. Now, it's going to take time because just like with anything that you're learning for the first time or anything that you've not practiced a lot, you'll eventually get rusty. Or you'll not know what to actually do. You know it takes time. Uh, I think about sports with soccer. It took me a long time to get to the skill level that I was at when I uh, was recruited to play in college for the one year. It wasn't that big of a deal. But for the one year that I I sat the bench, it took me a lot of work to go and sit a bench. But I got scholarship money, so that's what's worth it. And um, But from then till now, I'm a worse soccer player than I was then because I've not practiced it. I, I coach now, but, but I'm not actively practicing it to the level that I was back then. And so even though you might know how to use it, you might know how to use the Word of God, unless you're practicing it every day with some level of intensity, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your, your game, and you're still going to losing battles. But he took this time, Jesus took this time for 30 years, 
before his ministry to learn how to use this double-edged sword so that he could demonstrate it in this moment at the beginning. So when he's tempted in the wilderness, we see that he can only find victory over his temptations, but he would also demonstrate how to use scripture so that we can be successful in our own battles. So let's break this down uh, with each temptation. Satan says, tell each of these stones to become bread and you can eat, you can fill yourself up. And Jesus replies in Matthew 4.4, 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, what he uses is the scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. This is the scripture that he uses. And uh, with context, I want to read the surrounding verses uh, to give you a little bit more. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 says, Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and enter and possess the land the Lord has promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then that your heart, uh, in your heart as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord God disciplines you. Not only did Jesus use this piece of scripture with the bread and the manna from the passage directly relating what he was talking about then, but he also addressed his current situation in the wilderness and his current situation of being tested in the wilderness. And I love this connection that Jesus is looking at his current situation. God has led him into the wilderness to be tested, and he uses a passage of scripture. When Satan tempts him to eat, he's like, wait, no, this scripture tells me, I've seen this before, I've heard this before, I was there as Jesus. I, I see that God told me that he would provide for me, and what you're telling me is to provide for myself, so no, I'm not going to come into that because God will always provide the manna. In fact, what he was teaching the disciples back then or the, the Israelites back then is that I should live on the word of God and the word of God tells me that he's gonna provide for me because in context, that's exactly what he did. He made sure my feet didn't swell. He made sure that I had manna to eat, that I had water to drink. And so even though I'm in the wilderness right now in this moment being tested, you're not gonna have any foothold on me because I know the word. I'm seeing how it's relating to my current situation, and I'm going to use it to declare truth. So when Satan tells this lie, that there's an easier way to serve the Lord, there's a better, more satisfying way to fulfill yourself and to fulfill God's commands, Jesus declares truth. God is the only way. And I trust him wholeheartedly and fully that when he leads me into the wilderness, He's going to provide for me. He's going to take care of me, just as he did in the wilderness with the Israelites. So then Satan comes back at him again. He says, well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written in Psalm 92 that the angels basically just won't let you get hurt. And Jesus replies with another verse from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, 16, which says, do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did in, uh, in Massa. Now, this uh, verse can actually be connected to a story in Exodus where the Israelites were tested by the Lord by going into the wilderness, same situation, going into the wilderness and not having any food. But then when they were given manna, if you remember the story, you know that God told them, only take what you need for today, for tomorrow I'll give you more. And the only exception to that rule was when it came to the day before Sabbath, he would give double so that you would not have to go out and work and gather on the Sabbath day. And what did the Israelites do? They tested God's word by going and gathering more than what they actually needed. And what happened was that the bread, the manna that they gathered that was extra that they didn't need, rotted the next morning. So they weren't able to go and eat. That, that food was wasted. And so Jesus, using this, knowing all of the scripture that he's memorized, knowing scripture in God's heart, says, well, 
even though you're using that verse out of context in Psalm 92, here's something else that God did. The Israelites, they tested God and it didn't work out for them. So I know that if I test God, as he commanded me not to, if I test God, then it's going to lead to my own destruction. And I would rather stay loyal to God than go and find my own destruction. So Satan, even though you're using a verse out of context and you're testing my knowledge on scripture and you're testing my loyalty to God by using these scriptures, I'm not only going to dismiss the lie to test the word of God and see if it's true, but I also know that when people have done it in the past in the scripture, it did not work out. So I'm not going to test the word of God. In fact, I already know that it's not the word of God because God did not tell me to jump off of this temple. He did not tell me to throw myself down. You did. And I know the voice of my father and my father did not lead me to that, so I won't. Satan tempts him a third time and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He's all the splendor. He says, I'll give it all to you if you worship me. If you remember last week, I, I gave this kind of illustration of maybe what Satan was actually offering and tempting Jesus was uh, a different way to go and save the whole world. That when uh, Satan was walking around, he's like, I have all of these people all across the world and all of these kingdoms in my chains of sin. And I'll give you the keys if you worship me. And what Jesus actually does, he's like, no, I'm not going to take the keys from you and worship you. In fact, I'm going to go and I'm going to, at the end of time, I'm going to stomp you into the ground and I'm going to give you the key. I'm going to take the keys for myself because I've destroyed you, not worshiped you. But he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 13. He says, fear the Lord your God or worship the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. And then in context, which includes the previous Deuteronomy 1, I want to continue and read out the rest of that section. Verse 14, do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you, for the Lord your God who is coming to you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did in Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given to you. Do what is right, do, is, do what is good in the Lord's sight so that all may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord has promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all of your enemies before you, as the Lord said. And in the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulation, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves in Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt into a mighty, and it's with his mighty hand before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders great and terrible on Egypt and Pharaoh and the whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all of these decrees and to fear or worship the Lord our God so that we may always prosper and be kept alive as in the case today. And if we are careful to obey all of this law before the Lord our God, he has commanded us that that will be our righteousness. By now, I hope that you see that Jesus is using scripture that specifically applies to his situation, his current context, and he repeats it over and over again. And so as Satan will continue to tell and share the same lies over and over, deepening that rut, what Jesus is saying, to combat that, you, you, you declare truth over the lie, and you repeat it over and over and over again to develop the rut of truth so that you don't stray from the path. So when you start developing this and you're declaring truth and you're developing this truth right within you, knowing the word of God and knowing that Jesus used it so that he would develop this truth right, that when you're tempted to go outside, you say, I can't. I can't turn my wheels anymore because I know the truth. And, and I believe the truth of God's word. I've developed these ruts so that anything that Satan throws out me, I will stay on the path. Because I, I want to stay on the path 
but I'm in this path for the next 200 miles. I'm in this rut for the next 30, 40, 50, however long my life will last, I will continue to stay in this rut because I chose my rut carefully. I chose my actions carefully. I chose what I believed carefully. And like all the cars in Alaska who drove over the highway to develop these deep ruts in the road, declaring truth of the word of God repeatedly and over time will do the same for you. So when you're told a lie from the enemy, it becomes harder for that lie to take root because you know the truth. So when you feel anxious, you might repeat in your mind all day long, Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So as you're walking through your day and you're anxious and, and you're feeling all of these different pressures, you're like, but God will give me peace. But God will give me peace. But God will give me peace. God will give me peace. God will give me peace. And when Satan says, no, he won't, yes, he will, because his word says it, that his peace will be given to me and will uh, transcend all understanding. I may not understand why I don't feel peaceful right now, but I know that God will give it to me in the end. So while I'm in the wilderness being tested with anxiousness, I will know that the peace of God will rest on me one day. When you feel depressed, you look at Psalm 34, 18 and say, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so as you're feeling crushed in spirit and you're feeling depressed and anxious and worried and fearful, you can cling to this verse and all day say, the Lord is close to me. Because in Psalm 34, 18, he, it says that he's close to me because I'm brokenhearted right now. The Lord is close to me. The Lord is close to me. And when Satan tries to come in and say, no, he's not. He doesn't care about you. He's not even around here. You can't even hear him. No, I know because the word of God told me in Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. When you keep falling into the same temptation and you feel very isolated, you're like, man, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know anyone else who's gone through this type of thing. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, meaning that other men and, and other women have overcome this. They have found victory in this. So if it's found victory, if they found victory, you can find victory too. So when you're falling into these same temptations and you're like, and Satan's telling you, uh, you're the only one that's going through this. No one would understand you. No one will, will feel for you. No one will accept you if you share these things. You can say, no, God's word tells me in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that every temptation that I will face is common to mankind. And I know that Jesus has overcome it. And I know that other people in my life have probably overcome it. So I can overcome it too. When you're struggling with pride, you can look at maybe a more negative light that comes from Scripture. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And so when you're struggling with pride and you're wanting to create things for yourself and you're wanting to do things for yourself and you're like, I can supply for myself and I have that pride and I don't have to trust in God at all. And Satan's feeding you those lies. What you can then say is repeat over and over, pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. So if I don't want to be destroyed, then I don't need to step into this because God word, God's word in Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride goes before the destruction. So if I lean into this, I will be destroyed. Maybe you're feeling envious or resentful. Job 5, 2 says, resentment kills a fool and envy lays, slays the simple. And so you, you look at that and you're like, well, I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to be killed. And so Job tells me that this is the result of that sinfulness. But you can also look in more positive light and look at Psalm 23.1 when you're feeling jealous. Man, I, I wish that I could have the life that they had. Man, I wish that I could have these things. I'm kind of jealous of these, these different things. Then you can look at Psalm 20, 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I don't need anything else than what the Lord's already offered me. So Satan, those lies aren't going to work for me. 
because I already have everything that I need to get through this season right now. And if I need more, God will supply more in the next season. If I don't need as much, then he'll supply less in the next season. But I will always have exactly what I need. And I trust that God is going to do that for me. So Satan, you can defeat all of your lies. You can go somewhere else because here the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. So whatever it is, whatever situation you're facing, the key to finding victory, the key to taking control of your life and is declaring truth over your life every day so that you can confidently say, Satan, there isn't a better, easier, more comfortable way to live my life and to live my purpose in Christ because God will always give me what is best. And if I believe that that God's always gonna give me what's best, maybe not what I want, maybe not what I desire, but what's best, then there is no better way. Like He's my shepherd. I lack nothing. I will have all that I need in every season of my life. So I'm not gonna take your offer to try and have more of what God has given me because this is all that I need. He's my daily bread. And even though he's led me into the wilderness, it doesn't mean that he left me. It doesn't mean that he's forsaken me because I know in Psalm 23, 4, it says his rod and his staff will comfort me as he walks me through the valleys. He will remain beside me. He's not gonna leave or forsake me. So I'm not gonna believe any of that garbage that you're telling me. He's gonna lead me into my promised land. He's gonna lead me into an abundant life. And I'm not going to not pursue that abundant life. So Satan, I trust him. And anything that he said, anything that's said outside of him, I'm not going to trust because it will always lead to my destruction. I know my father's voice and I know your voice and you're not my father. You're not my savior. So why would I listen to you when I only trust in God? He created me. He knows what I was created for. He knows what will work and what will destroy me. So I will worship him and him alone. So go away from me, Satan. You have no ground here. You have no place in my heart. And as James says, I submit myself to God. Who submits themselves to God today? Who who rebukes Satan in this moment? And as scripture says, Satan will flee. So if you believe all of the Bible, then you know that when you submit to God, you declare truth of your life and you rebuke all of the lies of the enemy, then Satan will flee just as he did in the wilderness with Jesus. And so we, we can declare today that you're going to start fighting this fight that you're gonna start declaring truth over your life so that all these lies that Satan's been telling you and that you've believed for all of these years, you're gonna declare truth and say, Satan, that's not true. You're not my father. You're my, my savior. Why would I listen to you? You've not supplied a single need for me. You've only supplied fleshly desires. So why would I trust you when you've always led me to my destruction? Instead, I will... Uh, sit down with my Bible, I'll study and I'll read God's word because if we believe that this is the living word of God and this is what God spoke through all the prophets and all the people that uh, actually physically wrote the Bible and that this is the word of God, then why would we not read it? Why would we not study it? Why would we not memorize it? There's a reason that it's a living word. It's not because we, we see it getting up and walking around, but because it lives within our hearts and it will continuously renew our mind and our spirit. So we can declare at the end of our day, every day, get away from me, Satan, get away from my family, get away from my church. You have no place here because I've submitted myself to God. So in your battles, in your mind, as this week, if you, if you make that declaration, man, I'm going to start declaring truth in my life. I'm going to start reading. I'm going to start setting scripture. Expect Satan to tell you more and more lies. Don't believe him. Because he wants to destroy you. He'll come in like a, a sheep. Like he's a wolf that's covered in sheep's clothing. He'll come in thinking, making you think, man, I really care about you and I really love you and, and this would be so good for you. But if it's not the Father's voice, 100% of the time it will lead to destruction. 
And I don't want you to be destroyed in your mind because if Satan can destroy your mind, he'll destroy your spirit and he'll destroy your body. So I urge you to make that declaration. I'm going to declare truth over my life. I'm going to start developing over time for the next few years. I'm going to develop these truth ruts so that I don't, uh, I'm less likely to go astray. There's a, a thing that Chloe's dad actually told me, um, and, and he heard it from one of his pastors, and I love it, and that's where I'm going to end. He said, uh, which he talked about sanctification, but I, I would call it being uh, more mature in Christ. When you start maturing and you become uh, a really sincere Christian, there's this switch that happens from where God, uh, where you give your all to God, but then when they, you start maturing, God starts to get all of you. And he said for him that, that he considered that sanctification of, you know, before when you are first saved, you, you give uh, or you get everything that God can give you. you. You get all the blessings, you see all of it, but once you start maturing, and he would consider it the sanctification, once you're sanctified, once you start experiencing that abundant life and that holiness, you'll find that God actually gets all of you as he continues to give you all of him. So church, I want to urge you to start giving all of you to God because all of us, we have something that we're not giving to him. There, there's something in our life that as we go through this process through life and we mature as Christians, we're going to find different places that we're like, man, we're not giving this to God at all. I've been taking control over this and you'll start identifying that lie, that you've given everything to God, but really there's this right here, or there's this right here, or there's a few different things, and it takes time to give God all of you. But I urge you to do that, because if you don't, you will never take control of your life. Your life will always feel out of control. Your temptations will always feel out of control. Your desires will always feel out of control. So let's start confronting the lies that we've been told and win the war in our minds.